There is something about a piano that insists on being touched. That was how the talk I did for 5x15 in 2011 started. They'd asked me if I would come and talk about a personal passion, and I suspect they thought I would want to talk about roast swan or braised otter. I said, is there a piano? And they said, yes. And I said, well, actually, I'd like to talk about playing the piano for 35 years and not being very good at it. Because we don't tend to talk about the things that we do which we love, but aren't very good at. As a journalist, I go out and I interview people who are very, very good at things and ask them how they do it. But pianos have been a part of my life, however bad I've been at playing them, for a very, very long time. Um, and so I talked about this. I talked about the love of the object. I talked about the fact that when I see a piano in a room, I think better of the room, for the potential of what can happen there. How I mourn the days when there used to be a piano in every front room, in every pub. It was a marvellous, marvellous thing. And I finished by playing All of Me, with Rob, who's here tonight, um, in front of an audience. The first time I'd played in front of a paying audience. And it was a very bizarre moment, and I thought it was the beginning and literally the end of my performance life. <laughs> there was a woman in the audience from Jewish Book Week who came up to me and said, that was great. I'm not bigging myself up. You can decide for yourself afterwards. No, that was great. Can you do that for an hour? And I said, well, I can't do I'm shit, but thank you for listening. She said, well, you've got a year. And I, in a rather bullish way, said, OK, uh, a year. A year it is then. And a year later, uh, I, along with my quartet, my quartet, it's so ridiculously grand, um, did perform at King's Place. King's Place won on a beautiful Steinway Grand. Um, we did a series of jazz blues songs, we did Summertime, we did Black Coffee, I did a lot of patter in between, did that's all, good stuff. Um, and again, I thought that probably would be it, but it turns out it isn't. As a result of my appearance at 5 by 15 it seems to have snowballed slightly, and I've gone on to play at uh, this cabaret venue in Brasserie Zadel in the centre of town called Crazy Cox, played that five times, uh, a few um, festivals. Um, I've refined it down to a lot of food and drink songs. So I say Black Coffee is one, one for my baby. Uh, Save the Bones for Mr. Jones, great tune, you'll never have heard of it. Um, and bit by bit, as I say, it snowballed. We even ended up playing a session on Radio 3. Now, I have a particular line, and the line I'd, I'd used at King's Place was, if you know nothing about jazz piano, I am brilliant. <laughs> and if you know anything at all, thank you for listening. I've always thought that generally in a room when a musician is playing, and it's meant as no insult, but generally 98% of the people in the room won't actually be able to tell whether you're good or bad as long as you reach the basic standard level. You're playing for the 2%. The fear with the Radio 3 event was that the audience is mostly the 2%. But I think we, we survived. And I realized that I had to ask myself a question, which was something had changed here, that actually I had to take myself seriously. And this is not something as adults we're used to doing. When you're a young person in your teens, into your 20s, there is an understood way by which we find a passion and we get into it and we think our way into it and we, to use the old cliche, fake it until we make it. But a bloke in his 40s doing that? How do you do that? How do you become that kind of thing? Um, now, admittedly, I had an advantage in that there was always going to be an audience who wanted to find out whether the big hairy bloke off MasterChef could do something. A little bit like watching the dog walk on his back legs. And I could do the spiel. There was no problem with that. I could sit at the keyboard. Um, but I then had to think about it. How do you take yourself seriously? What do you do to turn yourself into something you want to be? One of my inspirations, um, I, I've got to a certain age where I'm not embarrassed about admitting things, was Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, there was an episode in which Data was on the holodeck, and the holodeck kept changing its themes. And in one of those moments, he ended up at a piano and had to play all of me and played it perfectly. And I thought, well, if Data can do it. <laughs> so I've come up with a set of rules, sort of ideas, five things which I think are about taking yourself seriously. They generally apply to music, specifically to jazz, but I think they can be expanded to other things. The first one is, if you think you're any good, you have to commit. You can piss around if you like, but if you think there's something you're actually, worth, you're actually quite good at, then you need to sit down and give yourself 
the benefit of the doubt. It happens that I have a very nice piano at home. I love them. My, my uh, parents have both gone now. I got left a legacy. I wanted one thing. I bought a baby grand piano. It is, the mo it is the answer to that question in the Guardian questionnaire, what's the most expensive thing you've ever bought? And I love it very much. I'm committed to it. I spend probably an hour at it every day. Second point is dive in. There are many, many amateur musicians who are much better than I am, whose voicings as jazz pianists, for example, are much richer, whose top lines are more lyrical, but they're terrified of other people. One of the things I discovered from this journey is jazz musicians are a little bit like the Dutch. If you make an attempt at their language, they'll be delighted, <laughs> and they're willing to let you in. Musicians are, are lovely people as well. Um, are you hearing this? Good. So be willing to dive in. There's nothing wrong with doing so. But also, be prepared to get completely out of your depth. Uh, there is no benefit in playing with musicians who are just as good as you are. None at all. Uh, in fact, on the occasions when I've done so, I found it deeply, deeply frustrating. You need to pull on the generosity of musicians who you didn't think would actually be willing to play with you. Um, again, in this regard, I do have an advantage. It turns out that because jazz musicians spend a lot of time on the road or playing in the evening, um, they're interested in their dinner, quite a lot of them because dinner is an important part of their life, and so they tend to read restaurant reviews. I do say there is a strong relationship between uh, restaurants and jazz. The guys I'm with have watched people eat in some of the best restaurants in London. <laughs> um, bear with me one second. At this point, I've actually forgotten what the fourth one was. It was very, very good. And I will remember. Number three, number four. Oh, yes. Be prepared. <laughs> Be prepared to be good across a narrow bandwidth. People are trying to be good at something they weren't necessarily good at before, worry that they have to be able to cover the waterfront. But the reality is, you only have to be good within a period that people are watching. The way to work out whether a jazz musician, in my opinion, is any good, is to listen to them for hour after hour after hour. Because most people can deliver something to you pretty good over a short period, but uh, it's when you get into the third hour, the fourth hour, the fifth hour, that the inventiveness really begins. Um, with me, I can do you about two hours, uh, and it will sound okay. Tonight, I'm doing four minutes. <laughs> Top idea. But there's a final point, and this perhaps pertains mostly to me, but I think you'll, you'll see the point. If you're trying to work your way into something, don't get paid. This doesn't mean you have to do it for no money. I, I have played paying gigs, but all the money that's uh, arisen from it has actually gone to pay the musicians who work with me, who are very fine and deserve to be paid properly for their work, and I make sure about that. But if you do that, then you are, in a way, coming up with the ultimate humble brag. So if anybody comes and says, why the hell did you do that, you were crap, you say, well, I didn't get paid. <laughs> it's fine. But I'm aware that on this journey of taking yourself seriously, there has to be a point when you accept that you can no longer do the humble brag. When I played here for 5x15, there was a very small stipend, and I didn't take it, it went to Rob, who played bass. Um, tonight, there's a slightly larger stipend, which enables the three of us to be here. Um, and as the journey to become a jazz musician, if that's what I am, I'm still a writer, but I play a bit of jazz, started by 515, I think the point where I start getting paid can continue with 515 because it happens here tonight. This is the first time I will ever take any money away uh, and I expect to spend it on a packet of crisps <laughs> and enjoy it and think of you. Um, we finished that last time by playing, all of me. Uh, you can see that talk online, it's, it's the video online, um, and you can judge for yourself if there's been any improvement because I'm going to play again for you now to see us out for the first half of this 5 by 15. So could you please welcome to the stage, on bass, Rob Rickenberg, and on sax, Dave Lewis. <laughs> now, uh, we're going to do you um, a little medley, which is a very technical term for three songs crashed together. Um, Beautiful Love will begin it, uh, Sweet Georgia Brown will finish it, and in between we'll go to No Moon At All, um, which is a rather cute song. I forgot to say to Sam, could you kill this microphone because I tend to sniff on the changes, it's a really, really ugly sound. Still haven't managed to get over that one. Are we cool?
Rob Rickenberg. On bass, Rob Rickenberg. On sax, Dave Lewis. Thank you very much. Oh. Uh, very quickly, okay. Thank you very much.